Hello everybody, how are you? Oh. Hello everybody, how are you? I just realized I was on mute. I also just realized I need to turn this camera on. One second, please. You might be wondering why I said I need to turn a camera on. Actually, the reason is because I just record everything just in case we want it for later. So, okay, great. Well, good to see you all again. Uh, today is Friday. I guess that means that we're going to do some Putnam problems. This is usually the last class of the week for most people. And what are we doing today? Well, the subject that we're going to talk about is an area of mathematics called functional equations. Although that's not really an area of mathematics that you see often. In fact, it's not something that most people ever think about. But it's an area of math that kind of appears a lot on contests. And also, I'll, I'll maybe say a bit about how it even appears with things that you might see in the rest of the world. So as, usually, as usual, this is just on the course web page, and I'm going into the handout, the handout for week number five, functional equations. Right. So what's functional equations about? Well, it's about trying to solve equations, where what you're trying to solve for is the function. And on this handout, you can already see that there are some kinds of these. I'm actually going to start by mentioning a few things in this classical results. Uh, functional equations say things like, I have a function, and it has some properties. And from those properties, you want to conclude what the function actually is. And one example, the most famous example, is something called the Cauchy equation, where if all you know is that somehow I have a function, and, and it's continuous, and whenever I have two values, if I evaluate the sum, evaluate f on the sum of the values, is the same as the sum of f evaluated on each value, turns out that this is enough information already just to conclude that f is like a constant times x, a linear function. Now, that's a classical result. We actually won't be talking primarily about that one today. But just to talk a little bit about how these kinds of questions about functions might reflect elsewhere in mathematics, I'm, actually put up, I'm putting up something which is actually a statement from graph theory. But I'm just stating it in terms of a function, just to show how general it is to make a statement about functions. And what I've said is, here's a fact that's true. We're not going to prove it today, but it's often proved in an algebra class. And the fact that's true says, if you have a function, and its inputs are two variables, each of which is some number from 1 to 29, and the output, if it's always a number between 1 and 29, if it satisfies a certain strange composition property, where if I take f of xy first and turn it into something, and take f of that thing and z, then it happens to be the same as taking f of x and then composing f with x and y. And some more properties. Actually, at this point, I'm going to already ask, what a strange property. What does this actually mean? Uh, as usual on, the, on this class, if you want to suggest something, just type raise hand into the chat. Can anyone take this funny statement here and turn it into normal math <laughs> or like normal mathematical language, you can type raise hand. What is that property of this function f? Raise hand Alan Chu. OK, I can't hear you. If I can't hear you, I wonder if it's because something's wrong with my system, which is entirely possible. Ah, yes, there is something wrong with my system. OK, tell you what. Oh, no, I'm going to have to go all the way out and all the way back in because I can't hear you. So you guys can hear me. No, I'm not surprised. Of course you can hear me. The main issue is that my speaker setup is actually not connected in. So if you'll hang on one moment, I'm going to drop out of the, yeah, I'm going to drop out of the Zoom. It's because I can tell you why. Actually, the reason is because we have a computer system in the office, which is used by many people at the same time. And if somebody else is using that system and using the output that brings out the speaker audio for MIDI here, then unfortunately, I can't, I can't hear you. So I need to go and rejigger the system. So what you'll see is I'll drop out for about 30 seconds, and I'll come right back into this. Hang on a second. Yes, OK. I'll be right back in here.
Hello, hello. Yes, yes, yes. So somebody else got host privileges. So just, I, I am back. I'm back. Yeah, you're all powerful now. So the reason that that happened is because uh, somehow Zoom, as soon as you leave the meeting, it gives somebody else host privileges and uh, we're all back normal again. Now I can hear you. Okay, let's continue the class. So all I'll say is please don't mute everyone. <laughs> okay, so uh, Ellen Chu, I think I just called on you. What is this one? You, you, you said something, but I didn't hear what you said. Yeah, I was saying that like the, uh, the first equality looks like an associative. Yes, exactly. So it's associative. So this is actually kind of cool. Um, basically, what we did is we used the functions just to encapsulate the notion of associativity. We can write it as functional relations. And if I want to keep reading this, and what is this saying? You know, suppose there's some other integer a, so that somehow if you have any other x at all, then if you take f of x and a, you get x back. And if you take f of a and x, you get x back. Actually, if anyone wants to raise hands, um, what's this one about? This is actually another thing. Rajiv. It sounds like the identity of this function. Sounds like the identity, right? We're basically saying that there's an identity here, okay? There's an identity, it's called A, and whenever you take anything with A in either order, you actually get back your thing. And then the next thing is I'm saying somehow for every, for every X in the world, it turns out that there's some Y, could be the same as X, could be different, so that if I take F of X and Y, I get the A back, or F of Y and X, I get the A back. What's this about? Anyone want to tell me what this is? Just do the raise hand thing. I mean, type the raise hand thing. Uh huh. Adivate nini? Inverses. Inverses, right? This is basically telling you that you know, if if a was supposed to be your identity, meaning you anything with a you get yourself back. This is saying that no matter what, uh, whatever number you have from the one to twenty nine, you can take the f with it and get back this identity. So they're the inverses, right? And then the thing you're supposed to prove is somehow that f of x, y equals f of y, x. What could that property be? Commutativity, Commutativity exactly. So, so it's like this whole statement here, I'm just showing how the power of the language of functional equations is very strong. Even though you might say, why does anyone care about knowing about a function? Well, it's interesting. If you just give a little tiny bit of information about this function, like associative, this is a binary function, two things and one thing out. But it's like, if it's associative, and if there's an identity, and if somehow everything has an inverse, and there's 29 things, 1 through 29, then boom, it's always commutative. That's cool. The proof of this you learn in a college class on group theory. This is actually just the consequence of a statement that says that all groups of order 29, because 29 is prime, are abelian. But we're not going to worry about that today. I just wanted to share how, you know, it's quite interesting that you can encode a lot just in a statement about functions. Okay, so then I'm going to, for, for this class, I want to maybe focus on the first problem on the sheet, and we can just think about how you go about solving any functional equation, what you do if you have some condition about a function, and you need to make some conclusions. And so the conditions that we have are, we know that it's continuous, we know that f of x plus y plus f of x minus y is just double of f of x plus f of y. And the question is now, what functions f satisfy this? I'm going to write the statement again onto the, onto the place where I usually do the drawing so that we don't have to look at this and so that I can keep drawing on top of it. All right? So the question is, all we know about f is that f is continuous and it goes from real numbers to real numbers, meaning that it takes a real number and it spits out a real number. And what we know is that for any x and y, if I took f of x plus y and I add f of x minus y, then I get double of f of x plus f of y. And the question is, what's f? Anyone have any ideas that you want to suggest? As usual, just do the raise hand. We don't need to get a complete solution. I don't want a complete solution. What kinds of things would you do if you're in this situation? Rajiv. Uh, so just looking at it, it looks like f of x equals x, or I think for that matter, f of x equals a constant times x um, should satisfy it. OK, let's start with the first one. That's simpler, right? How do you check? Well, what you do is check is you go, okay, 
is x plus y plus x minus y is it equal to 2 times x plus y? Hmm. I think there's a slight sign error here. Yeah, yeah, I messed up. It's okay. Don't worry. I, I, I'm just going to say we try. Try. Yeah, the great thing is you can always change a statement into a question mark, which is what we were doing, and that's totally fine, right? That's how we solve these problems. So it looks like x doesn't work. Ah, oh, interesting. What else do we have? Uh, AJ Lim? Is, uh, AJ Liu? Is that right? Oh, it's Lim. It's Lim. AJ Lim. Oh, okay. You want to try plugging in y equals zero. So I'm going to use this notation. This is not the official notation. This is just what I do. Okay, so I, I'm just going to say y, stick in a zero where there's a y. Okay? And if I do that in the original equation, what that means is, actually, strictly speaking, is for every x, the following is true, but we're not always going to write the for every x's. But for every x, we know that f of x plus zero plus f of x minus 0 is equal to 2 times f of x plus f of 0. Okay, at this moment I want to take a pause because uh, on the Wednesday class, somebody asked me after the entire class, like, why are you allowed to do that? And then I realized, actually, if people haven't messed with functional equations before, it is kind of weird. Why are you allowed to suddenly throw anything you want in? The reason you're allowed to do this is because here's what we're given. We're told that for any x and y in the world, f of x plus y plus f of x minus y is this thing. That means I have a statement that's true for any x and any y that I want. And this is saying just put a particular value in for the y. It's supposed to be true for that value of the y. So then we'll get some true fact and we'll continue to make deductions based on it. So in the functional equations, think of it as like, here's a nice fact that you can hit with any substitution of anything you want into the x, anything you want into the y, and just like do this enough times until you solve the problem. Sort of like how in a Sudoku puzzle, you can keep like trying things and it makes it more constrained. You have less choices on what you can put elsewhere in the board until you eventually solve it. Now, why is this good? So that was AJ Lim said to do this. Let's let somebody else have a chance. This is a great idea. Why is this good? AJ Lim found this out, and there's like good conclusion. Uh, I'm reading Raid. Did I read your name correctly? R A A I D. It's Hardash, yeah. Uh, so basically, if you, if you simplify this, right, x plus zero is obviously zero. But on the left hand side, you get two times f of x is equal to two times f of y minus x minus y. Uh, and so basically, what this is saying is that f of zero must map to zero. So basically, uh, all functions that uh, that map zero to zero will work. Okay, this is important. So what you just found out is you just found out so f of zero equals zero. And so now, let, let's be a little bit careful of the last thing you said. This is definitely true. You, what we found out is that if you know that there's this like function that satisfies this thing, then for sure f of zero is zero. That's for sure. The second part of what you said is any function that makes 0 go to 0 will work. We don't know yet. We'd still have to prove that. The reason we'd still have to prove that is because we only know that we started from here and we deduced downward to get this. We don't yet know that everything that has this works. And that's actually an important point about functional equations. It's that you want to show, given the, the stuff you're given, here is like my constraints on the f. And at some point, you want to say, I'm done with making constraints. Every f with this property works. So if I wanted to continue for the other part, I would have to now check. Is it true that every function f that sends 0 to 0 works? Right, that's what I would need to know. Is that true? If it's true, maybe that maybe then we can then we'll be done. Then we'll be done. So Matthew, Matthew. Yeah, um, I was just curious since we know that f of zero equals zero, we know that there's no constant on the function. Oh, separate comment. Let's go there. Let's let's put that down. Uh, Two point nine. Okay. I'm just saying like there's some other comment here. The other comment is like, hey, that means if f of zero equals zero, there's no constant term. Okay. So you're saying something like f of 0 equals 0 implies no constant term if it were a polynomial.
There's a reason I write that if it were a polynomial. It's because in functional equations, there's no guarantee that it's like a nice function. So, you know, it could even be like sine x. Uh, if it was f of x is sine x, f of 0 is 0, but it's not, not about a constant term, right? So I'm just going to put down this like additional point there. But let's see. What else do we have here? I see some people wanted to say something. Autumn, uh, Autumn Suku? Um, yeah, so I was just going to say on 3, we know that it can't be true hmm. because number 1, we said f of x equals x doesn't work, hmm. which fits into that um, yeah, okay, this is, this is how you, we, we need to think as we're solving this one together. And as you can see, we're not here just to be like, somebody's right, somebody's wrong, this is how we solve the problem. We think of ideas, sometimes the ideas are good, sometimes the ideas have flaws as we keep checking them. Turns out that idea was useful, <laughs> because we're not going to use that idea on this idea. Because like, we're like, is it true that as long as I have zero goes to zero, I'm good? Well, unfortunately, we found an example where it doesn't work, right? So it turns out, hmm, not quite. So unfortunately... not 3, because 1. Okay? But that's okay. Uh, it's like, thanks for suggesting the idea anyway. It just shows that we need to be careful that when I go make these deductions going down, maybe I'm not done yet. What that means is, this is only one constraint, f of 0 equals 0, and that one constraint isn't enough constraints to go all the way down to only the functions that work. So we need to continue doing more effort to reduce the possibilities. Not just is f0 equal to 0, there has to be more constraints on the f. OK, more ideas. Stephen Jung. I can't quite hear you, Stephen. I wonder if you're muted. We'll give Stephen a minute, uh, well, not a minute, a few seconds, and then I'll move on. But Stephen, I'll say, I think you're muted. And how about this? Why don't you try to fix your microphone? And then you can just like jump into the conversation. Did Chris mute him? Oh, come on. No, no, no. <laughs> OK. Uh, and Stephen, if you fix your microphone, oh, you want to just tell us. Plug in y equals x. OK, we can, we can use your chat. That's, that's good, too. So Stephen's telling us, plug in y equals x. And that's why I use this notation. Of course, it's hard for you to type it into the Zoom chat. But I think what you mean is this. Because if you say plug in y equals x, I don't know exactly what would that mean. Uh, do I write y's everywhere or do I write x's anywhere? I think what you want to do is where you see y's, throw x in. And you're able to do this because this tells you you can put anything you want in the x symbol place and anything you want in the y symbol place. So then you know that for any x, then you have f of x plus x plus f of x minus x is equal to 2 times f of x plus f of x. This is a good substitution. Why is that? Let's simplify it. I, I mean, this is the part that I'm sure everyone can do. This is f of 2x plus f of 0 is equal to how much f of x is here? Well, there's like a 2 f of x's, but times 2, 4 f of x's. So what? I should do one more step here. Can someone tell me what I should do to clean this up one more step? Just do a raise hand and we'll get your idea real fast. We're going to get to the first, well, all of these were good observations too, but like a, a certain powerful observation here. Raise hand, Matt. Is that a Matt Kern? Yeah, we know that f of 0 is 0. Yes, you know that f of 0 is 0. That was from idea number 2, right? And that's why the way we solve all these functional equations is we just write down stuff and we use the previous stuff. If that's 0 because of 2, I got my first kind of big general conclusion, f of 2x is always 4 f of x. OK, I mean, that's not telling me what f of x is, but it tells me there's some relationship between f of double of something and f of the first thing. More ideas. Chris, raise hand. Um, what happens if you were to recursively expand that last thing? Ooh, yeah. Can you tell me an example of an f of something that you're interested in? Ah, do you mean f of x equals a quarter of f of 2x? Is that what you mean? Yeah. Oh, yeah, let's try that. OK, so we have number 5. I'm just going to write down on the next screen, and then we'll simplify it. Uh, step 5 said f of 2x is equal to 4 f of x. OK? Actually, I'll, I'll remember that was called 5. f of 2x 
was equal to 4 f of x. And then your idea was solve for f of x. f of x is equal to a quarter f of 2x. Okay? But if it's a quarter f of 2x, then f of x, you can do it again. You want to expand it again. Expand it again means, well, it's equal to a quarter f of 2x. And that's equal to, how do you want to do this? Um, a quarter of a quarter of f of 4x. Yeah, that works. You see, the important thing is, when I got this statement up there, this first statement is actually true for any x that I want any x. And so in particular, when I did it again, you were using it again where you were using 2x instead of the x. So f of anything is just a quarter of f of double the thing. And you could keep going. So Chris's idea is we could keep going. Uh, what happens next? I guess it's 1 over 4 cubed. I'm going to use exponents. f of 8x. Did I do that right? I think so. And so on. Yeah. Cool. What else can I do? More hands. I see all these hands now. Uh, John Wang. Say again. Oh. Oh, okay, okay. So what you just observed is that somehow the relationship between the 8 and the 64, like the 8 is the square root of the 64. And here is like a 4 and obviously like 4 squared, right? So you just observe that somehow the inside observe that somehow the inside is the square root of the denominator. And somehow that inspired you to think of saying f of x equals x squared works. So you have a claim that f of x equals x squared works. Well, let's check. Check. Is that true? I have the equation was f of x plus y, that's x plus y whole thing squared, plus f of x minus y, that's x minus y whole thing squared, is that equal to double of x, f of x, sorry, f of x, plus f of y. Is that true? Well, that is true. The reason this is true is because when I take the squares, I'll get an x squared and a y squared and a cross term, a 2xy, and I'll get an x squared, a y squared, and a minus the cross term, so the cross terms cancel. So it's good. It's actually true. Okay, so now we know that f of x equals x squared works. Does that mean that's the answer? We still have some work to do to do this. Let's get some more thoughts. Arya, uh, is that right? Ooh, okay, let's go and jump over there. You have a claim that it's an even function. And by even, what you mean is f, uh, let me write this way. For every x, f of x and f of minus x are the same thing. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Why? Um, so plug in, um, instead of y, plug in negative x. Aha. Uh -huh. And you will we'll use this like arrow notation, right? Plug in minus x for the y. Now I get that f of the sum of x and the y, but the y is now this minus x, plus f of the difference, x minus the y, is equal to double of f of the x plus f of the y. The y is the minus x. Okay? And if I have this, I guess we have to simplify some stuff f of x, well, why don't you tell me? Uh, why, why was this good? How, how is this simplified? So the leftmost term is f of 0, which is 0. Oh, OK, that's nice. And then that term is f of 2x, which is also 4f of x. OK, that's 4f of x. All right, and equals. And the right term is 2f of x plus 2f of negative x. Ah, so we get some. Cancel. Ah, I see. 2f of x. Subtract 2f of x from both sides and get 2f of x equals 2f of negative x. Oh, nice. Right. And that's actually what we wanted. If you have that 2f of x is 2f of minus x, well, then certainly the claim is true. So I agree with that. So that's good. So we've actually just proved, we've actually just proved that, you know, always, I mean, there's a 2 here, right? But just divide by the 2 and you get up there. So we have just proved that this particular function is even. 
which is consistent with what we're trying to get. So far, you've concluded that the function has f of 0 equals 0, and that the function is even. And you have one example of something that works, f of x equals x squared. Good. But we're not done yet. Let's keep going. More thoughts, more thoughts. Uh, Joyce, John. Um, so I didn't really hear you say like, what you Ah, we, are, you, are you saying that you want to make a claim that f of ax, just a second, f of ax is equal to a squared f of x? Yeah. So we didn't prove that yet. I think you have a suspicion that that's true, and that's what this was here. This was a suspicion, but we don't have it proved yet. Oh, okay, you might be able to prove it. All right, so let's, let's go to the next screen. Uh, just I want to summarize what we have so far. We now know even function, and 0 goes to 0, and that x squared does work. And now we're suddenly, because of this observation, we're going to jump all the way to this claim that says f of a times x is a squared f of x. I'm going to rewrite the claim, and then let's try to prove it. Sometimes making the right claim is a very important part of solving the problem. f of ax is equal to a squared f of x. And I left some space because I was like, what are the, what else should I write here? Uh, there's like for every a and for every x, right? We, we actually have to know that we can have any a we want and any x that we want. Just left some space there. We might get more specific soon. But now how do you prove this thing? You have an idea. Okay. Okay. So we want to take several steps. I like where this is going, right? So we will first prove for every a, which is a natural number, which is a positive integer, and yeah, we'll get that. I know what you mean. And then you want to then say like, will be easy to get for all, uh, let me write the for all, get for all a in the whole integers, and that will be relatively easy. Let's, let's, let's do these two first. Let's do the first step first, and we'll get to the second step, okay? And then, of course, you have some more things you want to go to after that. And, of, and actually, what we do want for the claim eventually might be not just a's, which are integers, but we'll worry about that later. Let's start with the first one. Oh, yeah, let me just say why you said this is easy. The second part is because the function's even. Okay, we'll, we'll deal with that later. But how about the first one? I'm curious about your first one. Okay. Okay, one second. So for a equals 1, it's just like obvious, right? So we want to do some kind of induction on a, some kind of induction on a. And you know it's, know it's true for a equals 1 and a equals 2. a equals 1 is just plain obvious. f of x is equal to f of x. a equals 2, we did it from somewhere else. It was like f of 2x is for f of x. But now what? Okay, so I understand what you're saying. For odds, well, what you could say is suppose a is equal, so let's write, what if a equals, right, a equal, that looks, that's, that's, that's supposed to be an a. If a is equal to an odd number, can I use like 2k plus 1? That's an odd number, right? An odd number is 2k plus 1. How did you want to deal with this? Okay, let's try that. You can throw those in, right? You can always throw those into the functional equation. And what I'll get is f of the sum, which is k plus 1 plus the k plus f of the difference. Oh, wait, I need to have x's around here. 
Can't forget the axis. Are you sure you want K plus 1? I want to adjust your thing a little bit. Can I do this? Oh, yeah. I think that's what you mean. Yeah. Okay? Because you want, I, I know you want to prove that. Okay? So if I want to do this, then it will be F of the sum, which is going to be K plus 1 axis plus K axis. Okay? Plus F of the difference, which is K plus 1 axis minus K axis. It's going to run into my head soon. Uh, equals double of F of K plus 1 axis plus F of K axis. Okay. Something like this. Now what? Well, let's let somebody else take a shot. Okay, so I see, I see you have something. Let's let somebody else take a shot at this. And if it turns out we still need some help, we'll, we'll pull back. Can someone tell what to do with this situation? This is quite good. Feel free to raise hand. Our goal is to say something about f of 2k plus 1 times x, f of a times x, right? What, what, she's, what she's trying to do is that there's some induction on a, and our goal will be to somehow conclude that f of a times x is what I want, and a is some random odd positive integer. Out of 8, Nini. So we could just start simplifying everything. Yeah. So we'll get f of a x. So this is actually ax right there, because that's 2k plus 1 times x. Excellent. And then plus f of x. And this is simply f of x. This is quite a nice solution. And this and thing over uh, here? Uh-huh. Two times, well, if we're using induction, we can probably use the inductive hypothesis and pull out all those k plus 1s and those k's. Like this. Okay, this is a good idea. Still running into my head. And actually, at this point, I want to add one comment. So this is good. Thank you. Thank you, Adivit. I'm going to add one comment here. We did induction. It's always safest to say you use strong induction. Strong induction just means assume that if I'm trying to prove something for a particular value of a, I've done it for all of the a's which are less than it, between it and zero. Well, not, not to zero. Although zero is obvious. Zero is true also. But when you use the strong induction, that's why you can replace each of these. This, uh, this, sorry, I'm writing so small. But I have f of something times x, where the something is a positive integer, and that positive integer is less than the a. Therefore, I can replace it by the square of that thing times the f of x. So if you can't read this, this is basically uh, k plus 1 squared times f of x plus k squared times f of x. But now let's just collect, collect stuff. So if I collect stuff, what's left over is f of ax is equal to, I need more space and I don't want my head to run into it. So how much f of x's do I have? I'll just factor out the f of x. And what's on the right is double of k plus 1, whole thing squared, plus double of k squared, minus 1. What's that? I sure hope that that's equal to the square of that. Oh, I see somebody did a hand raise. Raise hand. Simon. Oh, yeah. So what you're concerned about is like, hang on a second. How are we going to deal with this? Like, we're dealing with like strong induction for odds. Well, I think let me put it this way. Um, there's a way to save this. This is okay. You see, she did odds because the evens are easier. When she's doing strong induction, it's like, let's assume I know it for all the smaller values. Now you're doing an if. It's like, actually, I, shouldn't, I should not put a for odds here. Let me actually strike out the for odds. We're going to do two cases. If A is odd, we'll do it. And if A is even, we'll do it too. But I'm not saying I first do all the odds, and then I do all the evens. Do you know what I mean? I'm not going to say... Yeah, so, so the inductive hypothesis based on for all the integers. Yeah. Okay. Inductive hypothesis, the strong inductive hypothesis, is we are going to assume it for every integer from 1, 2, 3, all the way up to A minus 1. 
And now we deal with two cases. If A is odd, we do something. If A is even, we do something else. Both of them will reduce us to smaller values. But that's a great question, because if we were trying to say we just do it for odds, you definitely have an issue in that we can't necessarily use the inductive hypothesis, because I don't know if that's odd. Okay? But I know it's an integer. All right. So now we, we simplify this thing. Okay? So uh, this is the hardest part. It's the, the, the algebra. What's this? So this is equal to, so this is f of ax. This is f of x times, okay, this is 2k squared plus 4k plus 2, plus 2k squared, minus 1. Oh, it's perfect. This is equal to f of x times 4k squared plus 4k plus 1. And you recognize that as a squared, right? Because that's a, that's, that's a 2k plus 1 whole thing squared. That's a squared. So this is exactly a squared f of x. It works. So now we know how to do if A is odd. Can someone tell me why she thought that A is odd is the hard case? How would you deal with A is even? Does someone want to do a raise hand and explain? I can, I can probably fit that idea up here. It's like if A is even, 2K, now what? Ah, hands have gone up. Out of eight, Nini. Uh, remember that thing that Chris did with the, with the doubling? That the doubling thing, before? yeah. We use that. Yeah, yeah. So, so we can throw in the doubling thing, right? Actually, it's up here. f of 2x is just 4 f of x. So f of double of anything is actually just 4 times f of half the thing. So if I had a is 2k, well, then f of uh, 2kx is just equal to 4 times f of kx. Is that OK? Like, that's definitely true because the doubling thing lets me take out the 2 and turn it into a 4. But now I can use the strong induction, because you see, a is 2k, k is a positive integer. So now I can use the strong induction. So if I want to split this apart, that idea was idea number 5. So here we used idea number 5. But the next one that we use, when we get the 4k squared f of x, this thing is the strong induction. hypothesis. So that's all that's going on. I'm emphasizing those two are different things we're using. And so now that's great because 4k squared is a squared. So that's equal to a squared f of x. And so that completely finishes this first part of the proof. So for every positive integer, a, if I take f of ax, then I get a squared f of x. We still have to do it for all of the integers. How do we do that? Hand up, Joyce. Um, we can kind of do like something similar to what you did for doubling um, to like apply to the rational. Ah, okay, we want to go there. So, so let's do that. Let me, let me just write this down in case anyone, uh, so that we have it all down, and then we'll go back to Joyce, okay? So let's go to 15 here, right? Oh, somebody else raised their hand. Sana, Sana, Imani? Yeah, you can use the evenness with the strong. Yeah. To because you know f of minus, um, Good. let's say, ax or whatever would equal to just f of this, right? Yeah, let me write that down this way. If a is a negative integer, all right, so if I had to do it for a negative integer, what I would do is I would say f of ax, you're using the minus now, so I'm going to write it as f of minus a times minus x. Right? So far, nothing happened. I just took minus times minus is plus. But the important thing is now minus a is positive integer. So this trick is just, if I had a negative integer, if I minus it, I get a positive integer. Now I can use it. Okay? Now I can use, the, use what I've proved uh, in, the, in the step 13. Right? In the step 13, now I know this is negative a squared f of negative x. That was from 13. And now we use the evenness f of negative x is f of x, right? Because we know that from the evenness we wrote early on. Where was that? Oh, that was 10. Okay, so from number 10, we know that this is minus a 
squared times f of x, which is just equal to a squared f of x. So now we got that too. Okay? I'm almost having to, I'm basically just trying to duck into this tiny corner here. I guess that's called drawing yourself into a corner. Anyway, uh, so now, now let's go back to Joyce. Joyce has something that she wants to do to get it for rationals, because we want this thing not just for a's which are integers. So Joyce, back to you. What do you want to do for the rationals? Okay, let's try this. First of all, did I count right? Okay, let, let me write your claim again. So now your claim is for any a which is any rational number and for any x which is any real number, you want to get that f of ax is equal to a squared f of x, okay? And let me start your proof. Your proof was, what do you want to substitute? So for the y, you get ax, and how about the x? Uh, what? Oh, just x is x. Is that what you want? Um, I, I just, um, taking f, I was taking f of ax equals a squared f of x, that's writing, like, substituting y into a, a x number. Oh, I see, I see, I see, I see. So what you're saying is that, uh, actually, when, let, me, let me emphasize this way. If you want to write a proof, the way the proof works is you say, let's suppose we're given. So let's fix an arbitrary a, which is a rational number, and an arbitrary x, which is a real number. Now they're fixed. They're stuck. I can do anything I want with them. And now you want to plug in, you want to let y equal something? Well, that's, what I, that's, that's, why I'm, that's why I'm talking through this, right? I'm like, what are we allowed to do? What we're allowed to do when we're trying to prove this is we say we fix something, right? Because I got to prove this for any a in the rationals, any x in the reals. So stick them there. Now they're fixed. Let me attempt to prove this thing. So that's why I'm wondering what you want to substitute in. Okay, so definitely you can always let y equals ax. That, that's like, definitely you can do that. Because letting, you, uh, you can define anything you want, right? But then let's see how to use it. Then you said x is equal to y over a. Ah, interesting. So here's where I'm going, like, substituting into the equation, but we don't know that equation is true yet, do we? For rationals? Well, my question is, is A, is a, a rational or is A an integer? Because oh, the... Oh, wait. You see, my point is, if, if I want to throw it into there, I only know this equation for A being integers right now. So I'm a little bit scared of putting in oh, an a I which is sorry I should have said a is an integer ah okay okay so in that case what i'm going to do is i'm going to say let's back up a little bit because we're going to say the proof has to work for fix an arbitrary a which is a rational and fix an arbitrary x which is a real uh, can we do it for fix a is in um, integer and x is a real i understand what you're doing okay so here's what i'm going to do i'm going to just like i'm going to uh pause that idea for a while, and just go with something else. You're just like, hey, let's just have some fun with something else, okay? And you'll observe a fact, and we'll use the fact to prove 17. I know where this is going. So what you're doing is you're just going to first say, all right, you know, let's just, uh, we, we don't know that 16 is true yet, right? But we know from, uh, what is it? We know from the claim you have on 11, like we're going to say 11 is proved now. Oh, no, no, no. We, we have it from 12, really. It's, it's from 12. 12 is, you know it, for all of the a's, which are integers. Okay? Know from 12 that somehow uh, for an integer a, f of ax is equal to a squared f of x. So that's true. And now you're going to say, let y equals ax. Is that what you want to say? And you want to use this? Yes. Okay. Then... Oh, yeah. X perfect. equals Y over A. Okay, that's yeah. fine. And now what you're also going to do is you're going to put it in. Is that what you're saying? Now, now, now this thing tells you that these things join together, right? F of A times X. That's just F of A times Y over A. A is an integer here. And that's equal to A squared F of 
y over a. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Okay. And the reason this is interesting is f of y is equal to a squared f of y over a. Okay. That's true. Yeah. Now what? Aha, uh -huh. then you move the a squared down, right? So now what you know is f of y over a, of, uh, I'll, I'll leave it this way, f of y over a is equal to 1 over a squared f of y. So this is a pretty powerful statement. What you've just found out here, and the best way to put it, like we, we just did this to kind of deduce a bunch of stuff, the better way to rewrite what you've done here now that we know the flow of the logic is just you can say, actually for any y in the world, this works. If you say for any y in the world, I'm just going to throw y over a in for x, then I get this stuff. Okay. That's just a, a cleaner way to do this, right? So uh, I'm just going to emphasize, if I wanted to do it cleanly, I would, I'm, I'm striking it out just so you can compare the way you solve a problem with the thoughts and the way you write it up, right? So it's like, you wouldn't say this, uh, you, you wouldn't say the then, you'd actually put the arrow here, <laughs> and you'd be like, for any y, in the rails, right? And any A and Z, you could do this. Uh, let's just say A non-zero. Uh, you, you can't divide by zero. But you want to say for any Y in the rails, for any A which is an integer, non-zero integer, you can just throw in Y over A for X, and you get some nice conclusion that F of Y over A is equal to 1 over A squared F of Y. That's a really powerful statement. Matt, Kern, you have an idea? I want to let other people in. Ah, yeah. What happens when a is zero? Then you don't do it. <laughs> so so what, what I'll say is that let's write down an exact statement of what we just proved. We have shown that for any y which is real and for any a which is integer but not zero, we now know that f of y over a is equal to 1 over a squared f of y. And that will be all we need. It is okay, we will, we'll never need the one where you divide by zero. But here's a nice true fact. How can I use this to move up to there? And because there's a bit of shortage on time, I want to save some time by making a, by, I'll give you a suggestion. Remember I said, fix arbitrary a which is rational, x which is real, give a an expression. So just continuing from 17, write a as some fraction, m over n where they are both integers. Uh, let, let me not say both. Where m and n are integers. Where m and n are integers. Why is this good? I can use this to tie everything together now. I need to show something. I need to show f of ax. That's m over n x. I need to show it something. Can someone help me take this through one step at a time? We have all the tools we need now. Ah, lots of ideas. Rajiv. Basically, we'd love to show that it's equal to um, like the square of times, you know, the, yeah, a squared, which is n squared over n squared times f of x. Yes. Uh, yes. And so if you look at um, what we've gotten, yeah. So if you look at what we've gotten from f of y over a, yeah, we know that basically, um, it, okay, I, I may be thinking of this wrong, but say you, like, you know, we, we already know that you can essentially take this denominator and get it out. I guess we can also, we also know that if you multiply by an integer, if you multiply the input by an integer. Yeah, but let me save you time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I mean, I guess just like, first you can apply this, this property 19. Good, let's do 19 first. That's equal to one over n squared f of mx, right? No arguments about this, this is totally legit. And also notice, we don't need to get scared about n equals zero, because it's not. <laughs> That's not allowed. It's the a is a rational number anyway. Now what? And now you can apply, uh, I forget it's number. Whatever it was, something over here. Yeah. Let's call it 12. Like 12 was like for every a in integers, right? Let's apply the 12. Now you get, yep. And that's exactly what you wanted. Like, this is exactly f of ax equals a squared f of x, right? So then I got what I wanted. That finishes the proof of the claim. 
Okay, we're basically done. We're also out of time. Why are we done? Why, why, why do I say we're done? We, we now know some neat thing, which is for every, every rational number A and every real number X, this is true. Out of it. Yeah, the function is continuous, right? The, the, the thing is, the function is continuous because we're over time. I can't go into more detail on that. But if I have a continuous function, the situation with rational numbers is there's a lot of them, and also they're dense. For every real number, there's rational numbers that get closer and closer. So if you know that for every rational A, this is true, it's also true for every irrational A, because you could get as close to that one as you wanted, and the function is continuous. Only because of lack of time, I can't go deeper into that here. But I'll write by continuity implies that for every a which is real and for every x which is real, I get that f of ax equals a squared f of x. Now, why, what can we do to finish off this problem? Right? We know that x squared works. But it turns out that x squared is not the only thing that works. There's some more functions that are kind of like x squared that work, but this is getting really close to them. Alan Chu. Are you looking at it? Any constant time x squared works? Okay, I'm going to go back to here. Yep, back to this thing. Where did we check x squared works? Somewhere we checked that x squared worked. Oh yeah, number nine, right? If I just change x squared to like a constant times x squared, I'm going to put a c in front. If I put a constant times x squared in front, it's also good. Does everyone agree? Because the constant multiplied in front just puts the constant here, constant here, constant there, and constant there. And like it's just the C went all the way across. So that means the answer is actually, I'll tell you, the answer is f of x equals a particular fixed constant times x squared is good. What's that constant? It turns out that once you look at this, if I know that for every x and every a, f of ax is a squared f of x, you can actually tell what that constant will be. When I say what that constant will be, it turns out to be a particular value of f. Out of it. Just take f of 1. f of 1, right? So if I look at this, this is true, by the way, for every a in the rails and every x in the rails. Let's just throw in x equals 1 and see what happens. So if I use x equals 1 in the 21, I'm just going fast because we're out of time. If I use the x equals 1 in 21, I just find out that for every a, which is a real number, f of a is equal to a squared times f of 1. And this is that constant c, right? I'm just saying, like, there's a function. Whatever the function happens to be, the function has some value at 1. That's your c. And every other value of the, every other thing you stick into the function is just going to be that thing squared times whatever is that constant. So, for example, if f of x was x squared, then the f of 1 is just 1 and you get f of a is a squared. And if for some reason you were doing the function f of x equals minus x squared, well then the f of 1 is negative 1. And then this whole thing works too. So this shows that actually the answer to the question is the functions that work are f of x equals constant times x squared. And we managed to get to that by this deduction process by which there's nothing else that could work. And we also checked that every one of those constant x squared functions worked. And that finishes today's class over time, unfortunately, a bit. But hopefully this thing made sense, and this is an introduction to functional equations. Have fun working on the rest of the questions. Encourage, I encourage you to work with your groups. There should be groups for this week. And see you next time. I'm going to close out the YouTube.